Hello, welcome. Good to see you. If you've just joined us for this message and you haven't been listening to the whole of this service, then a special welcome to you. We're glad you've joined us on our Upton Baptist YouTube channel. This is our Good Friday message and I've called this message The Witnesses of the Crucifixion. Now it's right, isn't it, that parents should be uh, proud to a certain extent of their children and of their children's achievements, grandparents as well. Uh, maybe you have, like we have, um, a couple of family WhatsApp groups and on it often uh, there might be a post of a picture that one of the younger children has drawn. Look at this, look how good this is. Or maybe some of the older children, some exam results or school reports or something else that they've achieved that just want to share, look at, look at what they've done, look at what they've achieved. I want everyone in the family and maybe others to know what they have done. Now, God wants um, his son to be held up to our view. God wants Jesus Christ to be seen for who he is and for what he achieved. Now, in the Bible, uh, we have four books in the New Testament that are all about Jesus' life, his ministry, his death and his resurrection. Uh, those books, as you might know, are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And so there are four accounts of his life and his ministry, particularly for his cross and his resurrection, as we'll see on Sunday, uh, that um, four accounts of these different men, different people that give a, their particular perspective on the events of what happened when Jesus was crucified on that first Good Friday. Of course, today is Good Friday. It's the day that we particularly remember Jesus' death. Obviously, as Christians, we we want to be remembering that all year round, all the time. It's the foundation, it's the central part of our faith. But I guess particularly on Good Friday, uh, we're remembering especially the death, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And then on Sunday, his resurrection. Now, in these historical accounts in the Bible of the events of the cross, we're going to meet various people uh, on that day and that night uh, of what happened to Jesus. We're going to see witnesses of the crucifixion. As we said, the Gospels are eyewitness accounts of what happened to Jesus uh, through his trial, through his crucifixion. Um, and we're going to concentrate mainly in Mark's Gospel. There might be, be one other perhaps in John's Gospel, but mainly Mark's Gospel, which were the readings we had read earlier in the service. And these witnesses of the cross, of the crucifixion, have much to teach us about uh, Jesus, about what was going on, who he is, why he came. Now the thing is that many, most of the so-called witnesses that we're gonna, uh, gonna see in a moment uh, were witnesses, people that, that by and large wanted him dead or um, perhaps in, in, in one of them though wasn't, wasn't as bothered. He didn't care that much that he was crucified more than himself. But these were people who wanted Jesus dead, these witnesses. Yet in their opposition to Jesus, in their hatred of him, and in their words and in their actions, they help us to understand what was going on to Jesus and who he is. And they didn't know the full extent of the things that they said and the responses that came from them. So what we're going to discover as we look at these witnesses is that God was working through the, the wickedness, the evil of these people, of these men. Uh, all the wickedness that mankind unleashed against the Son of God, against Jesus Christ to bring about the greatest good that has ever been achieved. Now Peter, um, uh, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, he spoke to a crowd and he was telling them uh, effectively what happened and he said these words. He said, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. We can read that in Acts chapter two, verse 23. Now, many of the people that we're going to meet now, or soon, were those lawless men. They are the ones who had Jesus crucified. Yet all that happened to Jesus was exactly as God had planned it. And he's holding it up here for us to see, showing us, this is my son. This is what happened to him. So, yes, it was carried out by wicked people. And it was God's plan that it should happen. But those men were responsible for what they did. They still carried out an evil act for which they're responsible, yet God was using it for good to achieve his purposes. And so we're gonna discover some central truths about Christ. So firstly, the first witness is 
the high priest. Now, Mark's gospel doesn't give us the high priest's name. The other gospels do. He was called Caiaphas, uh, and he was a top religious leader uh, at that time. He's descended. His descent he could trace right back to Aaron, who was Moses' brother centuries earlier. Uh, so he was the high priest, and um, John's gospel tells us um, a bit more about him, about his words. Uh, John tells us in, in his account uh, of uh, it was some time before Jesus' crucifixion when the jealousy and the hatred of the religious leaders was, was intensifying towards him. Uh, and it was just after Jesus had raised a man called Lazarus from the dead. He'd been dead four days. Jesus raised him to life. And Caiaphas, with the rest of the religious leaders, the chief priests and, and Pharisees, they, they, they got the council together. Uh, they were really um, concerned about Jesus' uh, popularity and his fame that was growing. And Caiaphas said these words. Now, Caiaphas was a man who, wants, who didn't want Jesus to be there. And he said these words to the council. You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Now, Caiaphas spoke wanting to get rid of Jesus. He wanted Jesus dead. That was his, his suggestion as a high priest, as a top religious leader. We need to kill this man, basically. And they were making a plot to do that, starting to work out how they could kill him. So they wanted Jesus dead. And um, because so many people were, were following him, they didn't want the nation of Israel to be following Jesus. They wanted to follow them instead. They wanted to be in charge. They were jealous of him. And so he, he said, we need to get, him, get rid of him. Uh, and John said that in saying those words, he was actually, even though he didn't know it, he was prophesying that Jesus would die for the Jews and for all the children of God around the world. Now, Caiaphas unwittingly gives us a clue as to why Jesus would die. And we discovered that it's got something to do with one man dying for many people so that they won't perish. Caiaphas said it in a hateful way, but God was using his words to show that one man would die so that many would not perish. Now, sometime after that, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane by a band of armed soldiers. They came there with clubs and weapons, with Judas Iscariot, the, the, Jesus' betrayer, the traitor who was one of his disciples. And they arrested Jesus and they took him to Caiaphas' palace, as it was called. And it was night time. They were doing it under the, the cover of darkness uh, so they couldn't be seen. And Jesus was led to Caiaphas' house. Uh, the leading council was there. Caiaphas was there, of course. The chief priests, the elders, the scribes, all waiting for Jesus to be brought to them at night. Uh, they were trying to look for a reason to put Jesus to death. And they got some, some false witnesses together to try and uh, find a reason for him to be killed. And one said one thing and one said another and their testimonies didn't agree. Um, and Caiaphas stood up uh, and spoke to Jesus when all these testimonies were coming up Jesus, uh, coming to, to Jesus, didn't, Jesus didn't say anything. And Caiaphas said, have you no answer to make? But Jesus remained silent. He didn't say a word. All these false accusations against him, Jesus didn't respond at all. He didn't say anything in his defense. So the high priest, perhaps being frustrated, said to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? At this question, Jesus no longer remained silent. He broke his silence and he said these words. The question, are you the Christ, son of the blessed? I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. When Caiaphas heard that, he tore his clothes in anger. We don't need any more witnesses, he said. You have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision, he said to the council. And they all condemned him as deserving death. And then came the spitting on his face from the council, the punches and the beating upon Jesus, and the slapping him in the face, and the shouts to him of prophesy, prophesy, and how they mocked him and, and beat him and ridiculed him. Now, for those of you who may know the Old Testament, a man, a prophet called Isaiah, prophesied centuries before, 700 years before, he said these words. He was talking about the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah, and he said, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
like a lamb led to the slaughter, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus didn't answer any of the accusations against him. Why? Well, because he was going willingly to his death. He was giving himself to his oppressors and to those who would slaughter him. Yet, we discover that he wasn't silent when he was asked about his identity, who he is. He wanted, and God wanted everyone to know who it is who is being crucified. Now, it was that claim that provoked the fury of the religious elite. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, the eternal Son of God, the one who will be seated at God's right hand, sharing his power. His coming with the clouds of heaven, as Jesus said, was from uh, another Old Testament prophet called Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man is presented to the Ancient of Days, as God the Father, and given an eternal kingdom and glory, so that all people on the whole earth will worship him. And Jesus was claiming to be that Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven. That's why they tore that, why Caiaphas tore his clothes. He was claiming to be the, this Son of God. And they all said he deserves death. Yet the irony is that he is the only man who ever lived who has never deserved to die. Why? Well, because there was no fault in him. The council could no fault find no fault in him. All the uh, uh, false witnesses did not agree. There was no, he couldn't find any fault on him. During his entire ministry, no one could pin anything upon him of any fault whatsoever. He was closely scrutinised and followed. No one could find anything wrong with him. Um, and so he was he's being presented before us as the as the perfect faultless spotless uh, 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 son of god so what do we learn from caiphas our first witness well we learn that jesus is one man who will die for many people so that they won't perish we've learned that we learn secondly that jesus remains silent before his accusers uh, showing that he goes to his death in submission willingly laying down his life, being led like a lamb to the slaughter, fulfilling Old Testament prophecies about him. And we also learn that Jesus is the perfect, sinless, eternal Son of God, who one day will rule the world forever. He's the rightful ruler of the air, uh, of the world. Sorry, And this is the man who is about to be crucified. Now, all this trial took place under the cover of darkness with the Jewish council. And morning came on that first Good Friday, and Jesus was then led by uh, the Jews, uh, the leaders, to Pilate, who was the Roman governor. Rome was occupying Judea at that time. And Pilate was the man in charge of the whole area. And so there he was, governor of Judea, Pilate. Uh, what are we going to discover about Jesus from this man, Pilate? Well, Pilate spent some time with Jesus, interviewing him, questioning him. Uh, different gospel accounts give different things that were said. Um, but um, we read here in, in Mark that, that Pilate said to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, is Jesus' reply. And the chief priests are there then and they start accusing uh, Jesus uh, to Pilate. They keep saying about all the, trying to bring their accusations against him. But still Jesus gives no reply as they are accusing him before Pilate. No defence. And so Pilate is amazed that Jesus continues to be silent before his accusers. Now, one of the customs at that time was for um, the Romans to, uh, to release a prisoner for the Jews. They wanted to, uh, to show some favour uh, to the country that they were occupying. And so uh, a tradition was, a custom was that they would release um, one prisoner, could be anyone, that they request. And there was a man in prison, a Jewish man, whose name was Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was guilty of involvement in rebellion, uh, in a rebellion against uh, Rome's rule and for murder. And Pilate says to the Jews, do you want me to release, uh, do you want to release for me the king of the Jews? Or do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Uh, Pilate said that in a mocking way to the Jews because he knew that they delivered him, uh, delivered Jesus over to him uh, out of envy. And the chief priests stirred up the crowd. You know, we don't want Jesus released. No, release Barabbas, release Barabbas, they say. Then Pilate says, what shall I do with the king of the Jews? And the crowd shouts, crucify him, crucify him. Why? What evil has he done, says Pilate? Crucify him. And so Pilate gives in to their demands. Barabbas is released 
and Jesus is condemned to be crucified. Pilate found nothing deserving of death in Jesus. Again, no claim of wrong could be pinned on him. And Jesus continues to make no defence for his innocence to save himself. And Jesus continues to be like an innocent man going to be slaughtered. And the crowd demand the criminal Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. What's going on here? The innocent goes to his death and the guilty goes free. This isn't justice, is it, surely? You can't call this a just system. Yet here I'm hoping that you can start to see something of what happened. Now, if you were one of those men on trial before Pilate, who would you be? Would you be the innocent one or would you be the guilty one? Now, if you think you'd be innocent uh, like Jesus, then the Bible tells you to think again. In fact, the Bible effectively tells you and me, you are Barabbas. You say, what? Well, I, I'm not guilty of rebellion. I'm not guilty of murder. I've, I'm not that bad. I've, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I, I pay my bills. I, I live a, a good life. I, I do my best. I try to treat people well. But the Bible says that your guilt and sin before God is real, as is mine, as is every person who has ever lived except Jesus Christ. You and I deserve God's justice and punishment for our rebellion against God. You see, your rebellion, my rebellion, is worse than Barabbas's rebellion. His rebellion was against the rule of law in the land at that time, but your rebellion is against the rule of God, your creator and loving king. Right now, you're rebelling against him, the Bible says. And that is a capital offence. If, you, if you're rebelling against the king of the universe, your creator, that is a capital offence against the eternal God, who, which has eternal consequences and requires eternal payment for those sins. God's justice and punishment in hell for those who don't repent and turn to Christ is real. You've, offend, you've offended an eternal holy God and so your punishment without Christ will be eternal. You have not loved God with your whole self, with your whole heart, which is what he requires from every one of those that he has made. But Jesus goes to the cross so that you, the guilty one, can go free. Jesus is judged in your place instead of you. The innocent one goes where you should be and takes the punishment that you deserve. If you will ask for forgiveness from him, if you will repent and turn from your sin, if you will give yourself to him in repentance and faith and ask him to be your Lord and Saviour, then he will do that. He will be the one who stands in your place. So Pilate has much to teach us. God in his sheer grace and mercy and favour to you condemns the innocent one, his son, and lets the guilty go free. That is, if you turn to him and put your trust in him. Next, we meet the soldiers. Uh, Jesus is then led to Pilate's headquarters uh, and they call together the whole, battal whole battalion of soldiers. About 600 men are called together. It must have been a big area and Jesus was there uh, in front of them all, uh, in, middle, in the middle of them all, uh, and they make fun of him. They mock him. There he is, he's covered in blood. He's had a flogging on his back, which he received. Uh, so he, he would have been covered in blood and, look, and looked to stay. And they, these soldiers put a purple cloak on him. They twist a crown of thorns and ram that into his head. And they uh, make him look like a king in this robe and in this crown, which is a crown of thorns. But what a different sight this king is. They mockingly salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. They hit him on the head with a stick and they kneel down and pretend to worship him. The Jewish council had mocked him previously as a prophet and as a saviour, and here these soldiers mock him as a king. And so Jesus here submits to the greatest disgrace that human nature can, can inflict upon someone. He was cursed by men from all sides. Yet the irony is, irony is that these 600 men uh, worshipping men are in fact showing us a picture of what kind of a king this must be and, and, and will be worshipped one day. He is the true king, your king. 
Yet see how this king loves you. Your king is prepared to go through all of that for you. The thorns on his head speak of the curse that God has placed upon this world and upon every person that outside of Christ. And Christ takes that curse himself on his head figuratively as he goes to the cross. He wears that, uh, that crown uh, of thorns uh, to take the curse in your place. And so he takes the crown of thorns so that you can one day have a crown of glory that he deserved. And it's like he puts that upon your head when you trust in him. And one day the Bible says that every knee will bow before Jesus Christ and every tongue will confess him as Lord. But will you do that today? Will you bow the knee truly towards the Lord Jesus today? Will you worship him as your king, your rightful king? Not like the soldiers did in that mocking way, but truly, reverently, with your whole self, bow before this king who loved you and gave himself for you. So our final witnesses are the chief priests. And we can perhaps include the scribes here. So Jesus was then crucified at Golgotha, just outside the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they put the, hands, uh, the, the nails through his hands and his feet and he's, and he's lifted up and he's hanging there on the cross, raised above the ground. And many people taunted him as they looked at him on the cross. The chief priests gathered round, they were shouting at him. He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. And so they speak mockingly at him, even while he's dying in agony. Yet they speak truth. Jesus did save others. He healed thousands of people probably who were sick. He made the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He made the, the lame to walk. He cured every illness that was brought to him. He cast out evil spirits. He even raised people back from the dead. And he could say to others, your faith has saved you after healing them. Yet in Jesus saving others from their physical illnesses, that was to show the reason that he really came to save his people from their sins. That is why he came. So he could say to people, have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. That was why he came, to save people, to rescue them from their sins before God. So Jesus is the king who saved others precisely because he did not save himself. If he had saved himself, he wouldn't have been able to save others. But precisely because he, he didn't save himself, he was then able to save others. He could have come down from that cross, he could have saved himself, but that he couldn't have saved you if he'd have done that. That was the only way for people to be saved from their sin and their, uh, the, the effect of judgment before God was by not saving himself. So I wonder if all these witnesses have given you a better understanding of who Jesus is and why he came to die on a Roman cross for sinners like you and me. There's one more man we like to just think about that's the, the centurion soldier. Um, he was overseeing the crucifixion. He stood facing Jesus for the whole time. Um, he, was, he was making sure everything was happening as it should be doing to a certain extent. Uh, and he observed the whole thing. And he observed Jesus, all that he uh, said while he was on the cross and, ha and the way that he died. He would have heard Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He saw the way Jesus died, the way he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. And then he breathed his last. You see, when Jesus died, he wasn't delirious. It wasn't as though his life was ebbing away, which most people who died on a cross would have done slowly in crucifixion. These were not the words of a defeated man, but uh, the words of one who was in complete control of his death, just as he was in his life and in the trial and the mocking. So this centurion saw the way Jesus died, said these words, truly this man was the son of God. He saw it clearly and he spoke from the heart, understanding and seeing who Jesus was. So I wonder, have you seen who Jesus is? Have you seen why he died? Will you accept him as your personal saviour. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then it should give you such encouragement that if God can use godless, lawless men 
to achieve his purposes, can't he also use you, your words and your service for him, however small it may be? What you do for the Lord and what you say for him can have far more significance and far more consequences than you realise. So keep on serving the Lord. Keep on speaking for him. Even though you may not think it's not that much uh, that you're doing, that it's only small, see how God can use you in what you do and what you say in a far more significant and wonderful way that you can possibly imagine. You never know what good you may do to someone else. So may God bless you. Uh, we wish you a, a good rest of the day on Good Friday. Uh, on Sunday, we'll be remembering his resurrection and where this led to. But make sure you keep remembering who Jesus is. See who he is. See why he died for you and accept him as your personal saviour.